Jack the Ripper. We're in Whitechapel and the year is 1888. In this feature length documentary, we will discuss how Jack the Ripper did it, why did he do it, and who was Jack the Ripper. There have been five Ripper victims. There are many suspects being thrown around. Whitechapel in 1888, also known as Jack the Ripper's Hunting Ground, was where he hunted down five prostitutes. There were also many reasons as to why Whitechapel back then was considered uh, the perfect venue for, for the Ripper to carry out his various attacks. There were a huge amount of victims for Jack the Ripper because of the many prostitutes roaming in the streets at night looking for work. Furthermore, due to the lack of visibility, this also made Jack the Ripper's killings very easy. The, an example of this poor vi visibility existed in Whitechapel's poor gaslighting, the darkness and the fact that pea supers came in and out of London almost daily. As seen by this image, Whitechapel was a mainly lower class area, which means it was hard for the police to track any victims and the amount of crimes made it impossible to investigate them all. The Ripper's first victim was Polly Nichols. She was born Mary Ann Walker on the 26th of August 1845. During the 16th 1864 she married William Nichols and became Mary Ann Nichols. They had five children but split up after 24 years in 1881. He says because of her drinking habits. A year later, in 1882, William discovered she was a prostitute and stopped the financial age. By the time she was killed in 1888, he hadn't seen her in three years. She used the nickname Polly Ann Nichols when she was working. Many prostitutes did this as they thought that it would distance themselves from their work. Polly was a drunkard and she wasn't very reliable of money. She used lots of money so was always looking for more. She didn't have a lot of money to begin with, so this made her problems worse. She once had a reliable job, but was caught stealing and was chucked out. She had nowhere to sleep on the day of her murder, which means she was looking for work. At 2.30am on August the 31st, 1888, Polly met with Ho Emily Holland on the corner of Whitechapel Road. She is described as very drunk. Polly tells Emily she has had her DOS money three times that day, but spent it all on alcohol. Polly says it won't be long until she gets her DOS money. They talk for five minutes and then Polly walks down Whitechapel Road. At 3.15am, PC John Fane walks down Bucks Row. He sees nothing out of the ordinary. Sergeant Kirby, Kirby a few minutes later, says the same. At 3.40am, Polly's body is discovered in Box Road Wait, on his cross on his way to work. Her hands and face were cold, her arms were warm, so she wasn't killed long before. He doesn't want to be late for work, so he moves on and tells the next policeman he sees. The body is then found by PC John Neal. He calls for Dr. Reese Ralph Grellin, who lives nearby. He says she hadn't been dead for long and was killed where she lay. The body was removed and the evidence washed away. From this murder, we know the killer was left-handed. This is because he used how he used the knife, left to right. The killer had a medical background. The cuts and injuries were too precise to come from a normal person. But this doesn't mean he had to have been a doctor. He, Butcher would have had the same kind of medical knowledge. The killer knew Whitechapel very, very well to be able to get away from each murder and be able to find victims in the dark. Polly had five teeth missing from her mouth. There was a bruise running from the lower jaw and one on the right side of the face. These could have been caused by a fist or pressure from a thumb. There was a four-inch incision running from below the ear to the left side of the neck and the large vessels on both sides of the neck had been cut. The incision was about eight inches long. There was a very deep wound on the left side of the lower abdomen. This was very jagged and the tissues were cut through. There were several incisions across the rest of the abdomen. 
The weapon was a long bladed knife. The next victim was Annie Chapman. She was born in September 1841 in Paddington. In 1869, she married John Chapman, a Windsor coachman, and over the next 12 years gave birth to three children. In 1888, Annie and John Chapman separated due to Annie's heavy drinking. Annie subsequently moved to London and became a prostitute. When she was murdered, she was in her mid-40s. She was a short, plump lady with an ashen complexion and was dying of consumption. In June 1888, she was living at Crossingham's Lodging House in Dorset Street. On the evening of the 7th of September, Annie came back from a long trip. She told the manager, Timothy Denovan, that she'd been in the infirmary. When asked for her DOS money, she said she hadn't had it and was escorted off the premises. At 5.30am on the 8th of September, Miss Elizabeth Lang, one of the witnesses, was walking along nearby Hanbury Street when she noticed a woman who she later identified as Annie Chapman, talking to a woman outside number 29. She found nothing suspicious about them and hurried on. Noticing the man, which appeared to be a foreigner, had his back to her. <laughs> At 5.45 a.m., a resident of Hanbury Street, John Davis, got up and started to get ready for work. Walking downstairs, he turned down a narrow passageway and stood on the back where he comes across the body of Annie Chapman. It's awful! There's been another murder! It's awful! There's been another murder! He shouts. At 6.30am, the police surgeon arrived on the scene and said that the killer had partially strangled Annie before cutting her throat and attempting to sever her head. Her abdomen had been opened and her intestines taken from her abdomen and placed on the shoulder. The killer had also taken her womb. All of the servants again seemed to point that the killer had some medical expertise for the taking of the organ was quite skilful. The speed at which she had also committed these injuries also pointed to him being of some medical background. This crime caused a lot of anti-Semitism in the neighbourhood and mass panic. The next victim was Elizabeth Stride. She was born in Sweden in 1843. She moved to London in 1866. Three years later, in 1869, Elizabeth married a carpenter called John Thomas Stride. After the marriage, the couple kept a coffee shop. They separated in 1887 and by 1882, Elizabeth, or Long Liz as she was nicknamed, was living in a workhouse and had a drinking problem. In the year of her death, she often stayed at a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her murder, she spent the afternoon cleaning two rooms, which paid her sixpence. Later that day, she had drinks at the Queen's Head pub. She then returned to the lodging house where she smiled herself up and cheerfully said goodbye to her fellow residents. At 11pm that night, Elizabeth was seen with a man in the doorway of Bricklayer's pub by Watch two neighbours. Later, these men you. would tell the inquest that they were surprised at how the man was hugging and kissing her. When the two men called out, Watch out, the leather apron's going to get around you, the couple ran off. She then made her way over to nearby Burner Street where several witnesses said to have seen her over the next hour in the company of a man. This included PC William Smith, who stated that at 12.30pm he saw a man and woman, who he later identified as Elizabeth Stride, standing in the gateway of Duffield Yard, a dark and narrow court that led off Burner Street. At around 12.45am, Israel Schwartz was heading home along Burner Street. He saw a man attack a woman in the gateway to Duffield Yard. He crossed the road, not wanting to get wow. At 1am, Lewis Desmuth, the steward of the Jewish Socialist Club that overlooked Duffield's yard, returned home. As he turned his pony and cart into the yard, the pony turned away and stood still. Looking to where he was going in, he saw a bundle on the ground and tried to lift it. Unable to do so, he jumped down, struck a match and a woman lying on the ground. He rushed into the club for a candle and returned to the yard with several club members. They found that the woman's throat had been cut, however the rest of the body had not been mutilated. This led everyone to believe that the killer had been interrupted, probably by Dishmut. As Dishmut found the body, the killer may well still have been in the yard. The few minutes it took Dishmut to fetch help 
give the murderer the chance to hurry away from Vernon Street and make his way to the city where he could claim his next victim. The next murder took place on the same day, which too led to the theory that he had been unable to quench his thirst for blood. His next victim, Catherine Eddowes, was born in Wolverhampton in 1842. She moved to London with her father a few years later. When her mother died in 1860, Catherine returned to Wolverhampton to be educated by an aunt. In 1861, Catherine went to live with an army pensioner, Thomas Conway, who she claimed to have married. The couple had three children, but separated in 1880 due to a drinking problem. Catherine then returned to London and started a relationship with an Irish porter named John Kelly. The couple stayed together until the, t the time of Catherine's death. That September, the couple went hot-picking in Kent. They failed to make any money, so they went back to London. At 8.30pm on, on the 29th of September, Catherine was arrested for causing a drunken disturbance in Algate High Street. She was taken to Bishopgate Police Station and locked in a cell where she fell asleep. She woke up about midnight and started singing in her cell. At 12.55, it was felt that she had sobered up enough and was released from the police station. Once she left the police station, the Catherine turned left and walked off in the direction of Houndsditch. Mitre Square, the place of the murder, is placed around 10 minutes walk from Bishopgate Police Station and is just inside the boundary of City of London. It had three entrances very large one that led from Meter Square, the narrow St James Passage in its northeastern corner, and long narrow church passages that led from its south eastern corner and out onto Duke Street. At one thirty PM PC Watkins and the City Police passed the southeast corner of the square and found it deserted and quiet. Five minutes later three men left the Imperial Club on Duke Street and passed a man and woman who were talking quietly at the junction of the Junction of Duke Street and Church Passage. All around me are familiar faces, worn out. At 1.44 a.m., PC Watkins again returned to Mr. Square and found Catherine's body lying in a pool of blood in the dark southwest corner. She had suffered a terrible attack. Her throat had been cut back and her abdomen had been ripped open and mutilated. V-shaped cuts have been made in her cheeks and the tip of her nose have been sliced off. In addition, half her uterus and left kidney have been taken away, along with parts of her apron. Police then fanned out into the neighbouring streets to try and find the killer, but they had been too late. An hour later, news had arrived that the missing part of the apron had been found in the nearby doorway. The city detectives rushed to investigate, only to find themselves at loggerheads with their colleagues in the Metropolitan Police. The last murder was of Mary Jane Kelly on the 9th of November. She was born in Limerick in 1863. When she was around seven, she moved to Wales with her family. Mary married a collier named Davies. However, he was killed in an accident in 1882. Mar Mary Kelly moved to Cardiff and worked as a prostitute. In 1884, Mary arrived in London and at first worked as a prostitute in the West End. A year later, in 1885, she developed a drinking problem. In 1888, Mary went to the room 13 years old off Dorset Street in Spectres. She shared that room with a Billsgate fish porter named Joseph Barnett. Cool. However, it was not long Oh, cool, blimey, mate. This is September 1888. Mary was fined by the Thomas Magistrate Court for being drunk and disorderly. In late October 1888, Mary invited a homeless prostitute to stay with them. This caused Joseph Barrett to move out. She spent most of her last evening drinking. At around midnight, her upstairs neighbour, Miss Annie Cox, saw her going out to, into her room with a man. Mary was so drunk she could barely talk. At around 2am on the day of her murder, George Hutchinson met Mary on Commercial Street. She asked George for money, but he refused to give her any. She walked on and soon met a man. They started laughing, and the man put his arm around Mary Kelly. The two of them then went back to Millia's court. Just before 4am, several neighbours heard a cry of, Oh, murder. However, they thought it was either domestic violence or a drunken brawl. They ignored it. Where's At 10.45am, 
Mary Kelly's landlord sent his assistant, Thomas Boyer, to collect her overdue rent. Oh my God! Getting no reply when he knocked on the door, he looked through the window and saw a horrendous sight. Two lumps of flesh lay on the bedside table, but on the bed itself lay the mutilated body of Mary Kelly. When the police entered the room, they saw that her arms and face had been mutilated beyond recognition. If this wasn't bad enough, or the skin had been removed from her thighs and abdomen while her internal organs had been cut out and scattered across her body. The role of the police in the Jack the Ripper murders. They never really got anywhere with the investigation and often hindered it rather than helped. The problem with the witness statement. The police weren't very well liked in Whitechapel. Many wouldn't cooperate with them. The police recorded many fake statements and had received many fake letters. People just wanting the attention. All the sightings were at night when it was dark, especially in the gaslit, smog-filled environment of Whitechapel. People couldn't see very well, and at that time of night people were normally tired or drunk. Many people could have mixed up the time of the sightings, or have been mistaken about what they saw. And how much notice did they really take of strangers they passed in the street? Many witnesses also saw him from far away, which could have led to mistakes being made. The police often hindered the investigation rather than helped it. After each murder, they washed away the evidence to avoid panic. They also got misled a few times about certain details of the case, especially about Jack the Ripper being someone of a medical background. Over the course of the murders, there have been many witnesses. Some agree, and some don't. The first of these witnesses was Emily Walter. She witnessed something near to the scene of the death of Annie Chapman. She said that he was a foreigner around the age of 37. She said he had a dark moustache and beard, that he was wearing a short, dark jacket... A black vest, black trousers, a black scarf and a black felt hat. The next witness was Elizabeth Long. She also witnessed something near the death of Annie Chapman. She said he was of dark complexion, a foreigner, aged somewhere over 40, somewhat taller than Chapman, and he was wearing a brown deer stalker hat, possibly a dark overcoat. The next two witnesses were Jay Best and John Gardner. They saw a man near the murder of Elizabeth Stride. They said he was around five foot five, English, had a moustache and blonde eyelashes, and was wearing a full suit and hat. The next witness, William Marshall, also witnessed something near the murder of Elizabeth Stride. He said he was small, about five foot six, middle aged with no moustache, and stout with the appearance of a clerk. He had a small black coat and dark trousers. The next witness, Matthew Packer, also witnessed a man near the site of Elizabeth Stride's murder. He said he was around five foot six tall, clean shaven and dressed respectively. He was around 25 to 30. He was wearing a dark felt deerstalker hat and dark clothes. He was also carrying a newspaper package around 18 by 7 inches. The next witness was James Brown. He also witnessed something near the site of Elizabeth Stride murder. No. He said the man was five foot seven, stout, and had a coat almost reaching to his heels. The next witness was Israel Swatch. He also witnessed something near the site of Elizabeth Stride, but he saw two men. The first man was aged around thirty. He was five foot five. He was brown haired, had a fair complexion, had a small brown moustache, broad shoulders, a dark jacket and trousers, and a black cap. With peak. The second man was aged around 35. He was 5 foot 11, had a fresh complexion, light brown hair, a dark old overcoat, a black hard held fat with a wide brim, and a clay pipe. The next witness was Joseph Laurent. He witnessed something near the murder of Catherine Eddowes. He said he saw a man aged 30, around 5 foot 11. He had a fair complexion, he had a brown moustache, coat, and neckerchief. He said he had a grey peaked cloth cap and was sailor-like. The witness was James Bleckensop. He also witnessed the murder of Catherine Eddowes. All he said was that the man was well-dressed. The next suspect was Mary Ann Cox. She witnessed something near the murder of Mary Kelly. She said the man was short and stout, shabbily dressed, had a hat, blotchy face, carroty moustache and was holding a can of beer. The last witness was George Hutchinson. He also witnessed something near the murder of Mary Kelly. 
He said the man was aged between 34 and 35. He was around 5 foot 6 tall, had a pale complexion, dark hair, a slight moustache that was curled at each end. He had a long dark coat, dark jacket underneath, a light waistcoat, a thick gold chain with a red stone seal. He had dark trousers and button boots, gaiters, white buttons, a white shirt, a black tie fastened with a horseshoe pin, a dark hat turned down in the middle, a red handkerchief. He said that the man was Jewish and was respectable in appearance. Witnesses agree that Jack the Ripper is around 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 11 tall. They agree that he is around 30 to 35 years old, that he is well dressed but not very well dressed. Most think he has a moustache, but the biggest argument between the witnesses is whether he had a fair complexion or that he was a foreigner. Different witnesses could have said different things because they could have been describing a different person. They were, and they were all seen in the dark and all from different distances, so they could have been mistaken. He could have been wearing different things, and lots of these were drunk or tired, so they could have made an error. Over the years, there have been many suspects, some based on evidence and some not. We have created a list of the most likely suspects out of them all. The first suspect we will look at is Monty John Druitt. The reasons in favour of him being Jack the Ripper are that he's around the right age, he has dark hair and moustache, like most of the witnesses said. He was a respectable appearance, like the witnesses said. His time of his suicide was right for the end of the killings, and his dad was a doctor. But there is evidence against him being Jack the Ripper, such as there is no evidence of medical training, even though his dad was a doctor. There's no evidence of him ever visiting or knowing Whitechapel, and he could have committed suicide because of the loss of his job. We give him a score of 7 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The next suspect is Michael Ostrug. Evidence in favour of being Jack the Ripper is that he's 5 foot 11, which is around what the witnesses said Jack the Ripper was. He has dark hair, like the witnesses said. Often seen in a suit, so well dressed, like the witnesses said. And he's had a life of crime. And there's some evidence of him being violent. He has also been diagnosed with insanity. He's also a registered Jewish surgeon with medical knowledge. Evidence against him being Jack the Ripper is there's no evidence of ever being homicidal or attacking women and he's in France during most of the crimes. We give him a 2 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The next suspect is Francis Tumpletty. Evidence in favour of being the Ripper is that he claimed to be a doctor and there was a claim that he did medical specimens, including uteri. He was arrested but fled to the USA, which coincided with the end of the murders. The claims against them were never proven, and the claims were made by a trickster only after the press made a link. No evidence he ever visited or knew Whitechapel, and he was released on bail, so police had no suspicions. We rate him 4 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The next suspect is George Chapman. Evidence in favour of him being the Ripper is that he qualified as a junior surgeon, he poisoned multiple wives later on, and his arrival in England coincided with the murders, and his going to America coincided with the murders seizing. He also lodged where the first murder happened. Evidence against him being the Ripper is that there is no reason to suspect him until the trial. Thousands arrived at the same time, so it could be just coincidental he arrived in England at the same time. In his later murders, he didn't use any violence, whereas in all the Ripper murders, it was very violent. We rate him 6 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The next suspect is Walter Stickert. Evidence in favour of being the Ripper was that he was a hater of women and that he wrote some of the letters sent in to the police saying that he was Jack the Ripper. Evidence against him being the Ripper is that he was only allegedly a woman hater, that the DNA that matched into the letters is shared with 1-10% to 10 of the population, and some letters from family referred to him holidaying in France at the time of the murders, though he could have returned for each murder. We rate him 5 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The penultimate suspect is James Maybrick. Evidence in favour of him being the Ripper is that he had written a diary saying that he was the Jack Ripper. He had problems with wife, who was the woman. He owned a watch with the five Victor Victor's initials and I am Jack.
The diary and the watch has been matched to the year 1888 to 89. Evidence against him being the Ripper is several misconceptions that were appeared in the press were in the diary, so was it a forgery? We're rating 5 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The last suspect is actually two suspects in one. One is Prince Victor Albert and the other is William Gull. We will first talk about the evidence in favour of Victor Albert being Jack. They are that the authorities were covering up a crime. He apparently had syphilis, which is why he went after prostitutes. He was a deer hunter, so had knowledge to kill the victims. And he looked similar to du Druitt, so looked like how the witnesses said Jack looked like. Evidence against him being the Ripper was that he could prove that where he was on each of the murders. We give him 2 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. The second man in this suspect group was William Gull. He was apparently covering up a royal scandal which Prince Victor Albert was tied to. There was apparently an illegal marriage between Prince Victor Albert and another woman. And it was William Gull's job to cover it up. Evidence against him being the Ripper was this was all theory and no evidence. And they all died on the spot where they were discovered not to be moved like this story suggested. And they were all frenzied attacks, not calculated ritual like William Gull's plan would have been. We give him 6 out of 10 for how strong a suspect he is. Together, we give this group 4 out of 10 for how strong a suspects they are. Well, now we need to answer the big question. Who was Jack the Ripper? Looking through all the available evidence, we have reached at the conclusion that the most likely suspect is... <laughs> Montague John Druitt. This is because he fits the look that all the witnesses have given in and that no evidence and no evidence of medical training or ever visiting Whitechapel doesn't mean he hasn't had it or hasn't visited it. It just means that they don't know it. But the evidence is not conclusive, so it's up to you to make your own choice. Jack the Ripper. We're Jack the Ripper. We're in Whitechapel and the year is 1888. In this feature length documentary, we will discuss how Jack the Ripper did it, why did he do it, and who was Jack the Ripper. There have been five Ripper victims. There are many suspects being thrown around. Whitechapel in 1888, also known as Jack the Ripper's Hunting Ground, was where he hunted down five prostitutes. Jack the Ripper. We're in Whitechapel and the year is 1888. In this feature length documentary, we will discuss how Jack the Ripper did it, why did he do it, and who was Jack the Ripper? There have been five Ripper victims. There are many suspects being thrown around. Whitechapel in 1888, also known as Jack the Ripper's Hunting Ground, was where he hunted down five prostitutes. There are also many reasons as to why Whitechapel back then was considered uh, the perfect venue for, for the Ripper to carry out his various attacks. There are a huge amount of victims for Jack the Ripper because of the many prostitutes roaming the streets at night looking for work 